Good morning. Welcome to United Unitarian Universalist Congregation. My name is Reverend David Kramer, minister at this church. Helping with today's service are Meg Whaley, Alex Chilson, our musician, and Aaron Hurwitz, our tech. A couple of things to lift up before we begin. Today's service, as you can see, is recorded and made online. We had planned to be outside in the parking lot all together in person for a blessing of the animals, but the forecast looked like it was threatening. So we've decided to change it up a little bit. We're going to shoot for next week, 1030 in the parking lot for the blessing of the animals. Watch your email again and knock on wood, the weather will cooperate. Also, please mark your calendars for October 23rd from noon to 3. We will hold a social uh, social event in the uh, parking lot as well. It's a potluck. Bring whatever strikes you, and we will eat whatever arrives. Also, please mark your calendars for November 13th. The Black Lives Matter to Wisconsin Unitarian Universalists Coalition, of which we are a member, will be holding a reparations workshop on that day. Uh, there are sign-up uh, links also in your email. Today, we will be talking about Teach the Truth. This was originally planned closer to Indigenous Peoples Day, a week from Monday, and also in concert with some effort being done around the state. To, to kick us off, please center yourselves for worship as Meg calls us in. This is actually a statement that I read at the September 15th board meeting um, for the Board of Education in Waukesha. This is my 25th year of being an educator in the public school system. I am middle class, I am white, I am married to a woman I love, I am a daughter, a mother, a singer, a worship leader, and a racist. It is my 55th year of being a flawed human being who is far from perfect. When Black Lives Matters first came out, I thought to myself, yes, Black Lives Matter, all lives matter. I spoke with my minister about this, and this is what he told me. There is a house on fire in a neighborhood. The fire department arrives and begins spraying the house to put the fire out. Other homeowners in the neighborhood come out of their houses and ask, why aren't you spraying our houses? Don't our houses matter too? The firefighters reply, yes, your houses matter, but your houses aren't on fire. My 18-year-old nephew, Josh, died by suicide at college last year. He had good grades and was well-liked. We, do no we still don't know why he did this. His life was on fire, and we did not realize it was burning. Maybe if he had a professor that he connected with, he wouldn't have killed himself. I have made many mistakes in my life, some as a teacher in this district. When I make a mistake or do not handle a situation in the correct way, I admit that I am wrong, apologize, and try to make reparations. Dr. Siebert, members of the board, our black students' lives are on fire. Our Hispanic students' lives are on fire. Our LGBTQ plus students' lives are on fire. Do the right thing and allow our teachers to post in their classroom that they are a safe space, that all students are welcome, and that every human being has a right to be treated with dignity and respect. Please join me in lighting our chalice along with Unitarian Universalists across the country. May this flame kindle within us the warmth of compassion, the glow of love, the fire of commitment, and the light of truth. Here together we scatter and nurture seeds of spirit, service, and community. And now Alex will lead us in singing hymn number 361 in your gray hymnals, Enter, Rejoice, and Come In. Please join me in singing hymn number 361, Enter, Rejoice, and Come In. Open your ears to the song. 
So I have a story. This one is a fable from a collection that I like to read from from time to time by Arnold Lobel. This one is The Elephant and His Son. The elephant and his son were spending an evening at home. Elephant's son was singing a song. You must be silent, said Father Elephant. Your papa is trying to read his newspaper. Papa cannot listen to a song while he is reading his newspaper. Why not? asked Elephant's son. Because Papa can only think about one thing at a time. That is why. Elephant's son stopped singing. He sat quietly. Father Elephant lit a cigar and went on reading. After a while, Elephant's son said, Papa, can you still think about only one thing at a time? Yes, my boy, said Father Elephant. That is correct. Well then, said Elephant's son, you might stop thinking about your newspaper and begin to think about the slipper that is on your left foot. But my boy, said Father Elephant, Papa's newspaper is far more important and interesting and informative than the slipper that is on his left foot. That may be true, said Elephant Son, but while your newspaper is not on fire from the ashes from your cigar, the slipper that is on your left foot certainly is. Father ran to put his foot in a bucket of water. Softly, Elephant Son began to sing. Please join me in a moment of quiet reflection, meditation, prayer. In this time when the news seems to take all of the oxygen out of the room, may we find it within us, the strength to pay attention, to watch what's going on around us, to speak truth to power and to sing. Alex will now lead us in hymn number 395, Sing and Rejoice. Please join me in hymn number 395, Sing and Rejoice. <laughs> This morning is from our hymnal number 657 it matters what we believe some beliefs are like walled gardens they encourage exclusiveness and the feeling of being especially privileged other beliefs are expansive and lead the way into wider and deeper sympathies 
Some beliefs are like shadows clouding children's days with fears of unknown calamities. Other beliefs are like sunshine blessing children with the warmth of happiness. Some beliefs are divisive, separating the saved from the unsaved, friends from enemies. Other beliefs are bonds in a world community where sincere differences beautify the pattern. Some beliefs are like binder, blinders, shutting off the power to choose one's own direction. Other beliefs are like gateways, opening wide vistas for exploration. Some beliefs weaken a person's selfhood. They blight the growth of resourcefulness. Other beliefs nurture self-confidence and enrich the feeling of personal worth. Some beliefs are rigid like the body of death, impotent in a changing world. Other beliefs are pliable like the young sapling ever growing with the upward thrust of life. Something you might have noticed recently is that orange cones and cord have been placed around the burial mounds at Cutler Park with signs that say these are sacred grounds, please do not climb on them. What you might not know is that these mounds were most likely built by woodland Indians who began entering Wisconsin more than 4,000 years ago even before the Potawatomi, who were the predominant indigenous peoples living in this area at the time of the first white settlers. Linda Hansen, who served this congregation as its minister for five years during the time of its transition from McQuanago to Waukesha, researched the history of these mounds and wrote about the original plaque marking this site from 1959. Sometimes, well-meaning historians get their facts wrong, Linda wrote. While the marker in Cutler Park correctly identifies a large American Indian mound for park visitors, some of the details of the 1959 historic marker at the site have been found to be inaccurate. The city had many Indian mounds identified by early white settlers, well over 50 by some reports, this mound is actually part of a group called the Church Street Mounds. Due to some misinterpretation of early accounts by Wisconsin's first great archeologist, Increase Lapham, of his 1850 excavations of two mounds in this group, this marker mistakenly attributes contents of this mound that were in fact found elsewhere. Linda writes that while no connection could either be proved or disproved between these mounds and the reported burial on, on, on the Cutler homestead of Potawatomi Chief Leatherstrap, who is believed by, by one early historian to be the same leader known to local American Indians as Watsha, and from whom the city gets its name, the city, nevertheless, has found the mounds to be of sufficient value to preserve them. Some salient information for me. From the very beginning of European arrival, we desecrated this site. And throughout history, we continually get the facts wrong. In the beginning, according to the Potawatomi's own origins story found on the tribe's website from Forest County, the Neshnabek, original people, settled along the shores of the Great Salt Water, the Atlantic Ocean, near the mouth of the St. Lawrence River. A thousand years ago, they began migrating toward the Great Lakes. In the 1500s, near Sault Ste. Marie, the Neshnabek split into three groups, the Ojibwa, keepers of the faith, the Ottawa, keepers of the trade, and the Badwadmi, keepers of the fire. This relationship is known as the Three Fires Confederacy. The Potawatomi moved south towards southwestern Michigan. 
In 1634 came the first encounter with Europeans as the French explorer Jean Nicolet visited the Potawatomi near Red Cliffs, now Green Bay. This you might know. During the 17th and 18th centuries, the Potawatomi allied with the French to control the fur trade west in the western Great Lakes region. Then, between 1789 and 1867, in the course of 43 treaties, the Potawatomi were forced by the U.S. government to cede all of their lands between Wisconsin and Ohio. Important for Waukesha, a treaty signed in the mid-1830s ceded 5 million acres, including what would become Waukesha County. It was the largest of the sessions forced by the treaties. With this, most of the Potawatomi were forcibly moved to the west, to the other side of the Mississippi. This march became known as the Potawatomi Trail of Death. Meanwhile, Morris Cutler, the man of European descent credited with founding Waukesha, arrived here in 1834. When the Potawatomi were forced out by the army two years later, he was free to buy up land and establish this city. We are built, quite literally, on sacred ground, stolen by artifice, for a sum of $6,400, which translates to about $192,000 now, $100,000 less than the median price of a single home in Waukesha County today. I want to lift up this history today in anticipation of Indigenous Peoples Day, a week from Monday, and in observance of a week designated by a group of clergy and religious leaders known as Wisconsin Faith Voices for Justice, which is active especially in Madison and in Milwaukee, and which I have been joining in for its monthly meetings for some time now. The week of October 10th through the 17th is dubbed Teach the Truth Week by Faith Voices as a response to efforts in Wisconsin and across the country to scrub the curricula of our public schools of any trace of actual facts of colonialism and slavery. From the Faith Voices website, Around the country, the forces of white supremacy and racism are confronting school boards, demanding they prevent teaching the true history of racism, slavery, sexism, and violence against marginalized communities that is part of the founding of our country. As people of faith, we believe it is the responsibility of each person to do their part to address the systemic inequities and injustices of our society and to create a world where every human being can live in dignity and respect. Our children need to be prepared to take on their share of this task when they grow up. Yet without knowing the true, story, the true history of how our nation came to be, they cannot understand the underlying causes of the issues we face, and therefore we will be ill-equipped to meet the challenges they will confront as adults. As we have seen over recent months, the Waukesha School District has experienced these forces. Two and a half weeks ago, Meg and her wife, Mani, eloquently spoke out in opposition to the removal of signs that would proclaim classrooms to be safe space. Today, we are lifting up this small piece of history as one more way to resist. This is how we learn. This is how we grow. As Meg pointed out in our call to worship, the journey is personal as well as cultural. For me, I can say that my own understanding of indigenous peoples and my place in relationship has come in bits and pieces, sometimes by accident, sometimes by intent, and still a long, long ways from being adequate. One such formative experience came during the late 1980s on boat landings in northern Wisconsin. At that time, members of the five bands of Ojibwa 
the keepers of the faith, came under fire, literally, for practicing an early spring harvest of walleye by means of spearfishing, using lights from boats at night. It's a practice they have been doing for centuries, updated now with electric lights and gas motors, but still entitled to them by the terms of the treaties that have been in place with these tribes for more than 100 years. At the same time, some white resort owners and sport fishermen took issue with this, claiming that the Native Americans were taking too many fish, harming their sport and their businesses. The controversy erupted in increasingly violent protests at boat landings, including gunfire. As a young reporter working for the La Crosse Tribune, I was drawn to the controversy and I went up to cover the protests. My intention was to talk to both sides, present an unbiased report, maintain my journalistic objectivity. I also talked with the DNR and with law enforcement and all those involved with the legal case being made. I wrote an outdoors column for the Tribune. At the time, I hunted and I fished. My social location was the same as those antis on the boat landings. But the closer I got to the situation, the less sympathetic I became to the protesters. Their unwillingness to listen or to discuss their blatantly racist signs, their propensity for violence, all made an impression on me. At the same time, the DNR was saying that spearfishing within the quotas that were set was not actually harming the fishery. There still were plenty of walleye left to sustain the population, and law enforcement seemed to be nothing more than caught in the middle. But you couldn't argue any of this with the protesters. And I think I see now how distrust in the media, me, distrust of science, the DNR, and a disregard or at least a disinterest in the traditions of another culture also characterized their argument, just as these things arise now. As we read a few minutes ago, some beliefs are like walled gardens. They encourage exclusiveness and the feeling of being especially privileged. Other beliefs are expansive and lead the way into wider and deeper sympathies. I won't claim that my beliefs are fully expansive, but my perspective definitely changed. You might say I became biased. I still tried to keep my reporting clean, but I undoubtedly grew in greater sympathy. So by accident, I made a step, just as Meg related earlier, one step closer toward understanding toward truth. It came with proximity, with being there right next to those who were involved. It also came with reflection, time spent thinking about what was happening. And it came with action, moving me bit by bit toward even today, toward witness, speaking the truth I see. Just as it is crucial for us as you use to keep the flame of liberal religion alive in this time, it is crucial for us to keep alive this history, the real history of who we are. Only by knowing the truth can we hope to move forward in faith, in solidarity, in alliance toward our own salvation. There will be more Teach the Truth events next week. You can find them by Googling them. I will post a link in our Tuesday email post as well. May we all continue to grow, to learn, to come out of the shadows and shed our blinders. May we learn, may we teach the truth. May it be so. This is a song by Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. An old family favorite.
this week, whoever you meet, whoever you learn from, whoever you teach, know that you are loved. Seek justice, find peace. <laughs>